Ladies and gentlemen, we are finally live after uh, a few um, uh, bit of hiccups that we had. Uh, we are live 100% with Dr. Lee McDonald. I am thrilled. We're finally connected. Dr. McDonald, how is your day going so far? Well, after the blip that we went through, <laughs> I think it's going well. <laughs> Thank you for asking. No doubt. And I'm <laughs> thrilled. We are thrilled to have you here this afternoon. Just very glad that... Uh, we were finally able to connect and um, indeed we're here. We're going to be talking about a lot of very important things, uh, Canon related um, material that you've been working on, uh, books that you've done, uh, just in general, just really fantastic stuff that uh, I know you've been a great influence on stuff that uh, my very good friend Gary and myself have uh, really, really frequently go and look into your stuff. But, but you know, before we dig in, Tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you primarily do? And are you working on anything new in the, in the Canon-related field? Well, I formally retired, but I've been busier in retirement than, uh, uh, than I was, I think, before. But I continue to write articles and essays and uh, do things. I did uh, uh, an article uh, on the fluidity in the formation of the Hebrew Bible for a Jewish publication, and I've done a number of things like that for uh, uh, the uh, 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 Catholic. Uh, I gave lectures in uh, at the Pontifical University in St. Croesus uh, on on that, and published the articles that I gave from the uh, the papers, as well as in Athens and Moscow. So I get around and uh, get invitations. The last year, because of the pandemic, there's been not much going on. But the book that I'm currently working on is uh, the transmission of the authority in early Christianity, which was, uh, of course, the story of Jesus. He was the Lord of the church. And that story was transmitted to a lot of people who could not read. And uh, yet they heard it from the teaching, the preaching in their congregations as well as the hymns and the songs that are often ignored by people who do work in canon. And yet uh, the church continued and uh, the songs simply told the story of Jesus. And, uh, you'll also find uh, that in baptismal uh, uh, affirmations, uh, creeds that are read at baptisms and the Eucharist, uh, that's what the people learned about the story of Jesus. All of that before there was a New Testament to appeal to. So I'm, I'm working on that kind of a thing right now, and I hope to have that finished by the end of this year. It'll be somewhere around 400, 450 pages. Wow, that's great. Yeah, uh, uh, Gary, I heard, I heard you, you, you were briefly talking about uh, Dr. Emmanuel Tobe. Dr. McDonald was telling us that he's, he's actually very good friends with him. Oh, wow. Yeah, he is a fantastic scholar. Uh, I, I, whenever I see something published by him, I immediately read uh, just fantastic work. Yeah, uh, an amazing textual critic and knowledge of, is, uh, uh, of the uh, scriptures, uh, Old and New Testaments, and uh, linguistically, uh, he's unbeatable. And uh, I've, I've known him for about uh, 25 years. And he's written jacket blurbs, endorsements for, I think, three of my books. And the most recent one that uh, was pointed out, uh, this one off over here, uh, you'll find his name on the back end. And he's a gracious fellow. And we've been in each other's homes and had a number of meals together. So I, Wonderful. anything good you say about him, I'm going to underscore it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I recommend to anybody watching, uh, if you can get it your hands on anything he wrote, uh, Manuel Tobe is top notch. Now, warning, though, it is going to be pretty high level reading, though. So I yes, just be aware of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Really good, the number of things I have passed things on to him and he sent back, Lee, I think you should check this. And that generally means it's uh, maybe an oversight on my part, but nobody else found it either. He's, he's uh, a <laughs> man. So, yeah, very good. Well, that is uh, really, really good. I mean, I, I, it almost helps, right, Gary, to be almost, honest, say, hey, you know what? You got to double check that. Well, when you when you know a scholar on the level of Emmanuel Tove, I mean, <laughs> uh, you don't have a better resource, I don't think, to bounce ideas off of. Yeah, uh, well, he is he is remarkably familiar with uh, uh, not only the uh, 
the Hebrew Bible, but the uh, Christian New Testament, as well as the Septuagint, and a number of books that never made it in the Bible, um, uh, Catholic, Protestant, or Orthodox. And uh, he's, uh, uh, as you know, uh, was leader in uh, the, uh, directed the Dead Sea Scrolls project for many years uh, until fairly recently. And uh, uh, great, great guy. Uh, yeah. very knowledgeable. I've learned a lot from him. And I, my books often have a lot of citations of his work. Very good. Um, William, can I throw a question out? Or oh, how yeah, do definitely. This? Yeah, with, without a doubt. Yeah, as you could tell, we highly coordinated how we're going to run this. So you, oh. you're doing work on the fluidity of um, the Hebrew scriptures. Um, let's talk a little In bit that, about that. Um, what exactly... That was, is this in terms of uh, the stability of the Hebrew text, or does this also go into uh, canonics? Well, uh, that was published actually in January in a Hebrew uh, journal, uh, but uh, the focus of it was uh, on the fluidity. What I meant by that was in the time of the first century, the common era, uh, the New Testament period, uh, there were all kinds of writings that the uh, early Christians cited, and uh, you'll find those many of those in uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, I say by citing, they made use of them. And uh, so there really was no firm commitment on the scope of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the first time we see the books listed, uh, and it's called a baraita, that's an external tradition that was written somewhere in the second century could be as late as the late first century, but uh, it wasn't bought into. There was no tripartite, uh, three-part Old Testament uh, law, prophets, and writings uh, at that time. And uh, even as late as the fourth century, people, uh, the Jews are still speaking in the rabbinic tradition of only uh, the uh, law and the prophets or the law of Moses and the prophets. And they included much of what we have and that third part of the Old Testament is simply a part of the prophets, and they're identified that way. Psalms is called prophets, of course, in the book of Acts, or a prophet. Um, so that's the kind of a thing. It shows the fluidity, and they never had a council to say these books and no others, but tradition uh, came into place, and the Barite, it's called, uh, it's found in the Babylonian Talmud, uh, the Babylonian Talmud, uh, Baba Bathra 14b is the text, and 14a and b have the, uh, a has the books of Moses, that was never in doubt, the Pentateuch, uh, and then the, they identify all of the books in the second two parts, but uh, that was not widespread or uh, uh, early uh, 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 agreed upon. And I've listed in some of my works uh, several books that were still being contested well into the fourth and fifth century. Uh, Esther, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, uh, Ezekiel, because it differs from the, uh, the Pentateuch on, uh, the, uh, uh, on the temple, uh, the tabernacle, and so on. Uh, there's a number of books that were still up for grabs uh, well into the uh, uh, rabbinic period. And so I wrote on that, and it speaks about the fluidity of it. You don't find a great deal of variation uh, after the fourth or fifth century in the rabbinic tradition, but the rabbinic tradition doesn't speak for all Jews everywhere in the Greco-Roman world. And as late as the eighth and ninth century, Jews in the Hellenistic world were still citing from the Septuagint uh, the uh, books that... Uh, we call uh, deuterocanonical or apocryphal uh, in the Protestant tradition, but that, that shows it was something that took place over a long time, many centuries, which is also true for the Christian community. Right. Uh, we didn't have a firm New Testament at the end of the second century or the, even the fourth or fifth, and even when list began to emerge in the fourth and fifth centuries of uh, the Christians' sacred scriptures that could be read in churches, and that's what canon was. Canon meant uh, the authoritative writings that could be read in the churches. Uh, there was no agreement on those for centuries and never has been altogether between the Orthodox and the Christians and the Protestants. 
So that, uh, uh, that continued on for quite some period of time. And as late as the 1850s, you'll find the Arminians uh, still had uh, third Corinthians in their Bible. And uh, then it finally went out. So uh, Protestants continued the apocryphal books uh, and you'll find them in the King James Bible, the earliest editions of it, they were taken out subsequently. And then uh, the, uh, NI, uh, the RSV uh, reinserted them and published a Protestant Bible using the model of Martin Luther, uh, where he put the deuterocanonical books between the Old and the New Testaments and uh, the Protestant Bibles that have them. Otherwise, the Catholic and Orthodox Bibles always put them in the genres uh, where they occur, as in the history books or the poetic books or uh, the prophetic. Yeah, very I good. don't know if I'm yep. too long on this, but... Oh, no, no, please. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> please go on. So, uh, well, I mean, boy, you, you laid a lot there. Uh, so the, the threefold division of law, prophets, and writings, um, that comes much later than well into the Christian era then. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you don't have a tripartite Old Testament uh, uh, canon or Hebrew Bible until uh, uh, the late second century. And that varieta that I mentioned, it's external. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's called a varieta is it wasn't popular enough to be included in the Mishnah. And uh, the Mishnah is really uh, codified about 220 AD. And it's all of the Tanaitic uh, writings and uh, oral traditions that became the oral Torah uh, for the Jews at, uh, uh, in, that, uh, uh, in that period. And almost as soon as it was codified, uh, the Mishnah, then they had the Amorim interpreting it. And that's where we come up with the two Talmuds, the uh, Yerushalmi for Palestine, Jerusalem, and the Bavli from the Babylonian Talmud. But uh, there was a lot of uncertainty for quite some period of time on the dimensions of the Hebrew scriptures. And uh, the churches have never fully agreed. Uh, I have great appreciation for the Catholic and Orthodox traditions that welcome them because there's a lot in them that help us understand the, uh, the New Testament writings. And they're the, a bridge in a way between the two uh, Hebrew Bible, uh, Old Testament scriptures uh, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, and the New Testament. So that's the kind of a thing that, uh, uh, besides, some of them are very entertaining. I, I love reading uh, Tobit and uh, Judith, and uh, uh, they were written probably uh, in the middle, uh, early to middle second century B.C., and uh, Wisdom of Solomon, probably written about 50 to uh, B.C. to about that much uh, A.D. Uh, or C.E. Uh, those, those texts are very enjoyable reading. And I read Sirach or Ecclesiasticus. I saw a part of the funeral for uh, Prince Philip this morning. And they read, well, the first reading was from Ecclesiasticus. Mm -hmm. which shows the uh, uh, Episcopal uh, Church of England tradition, uh, where those texts are not used for the establishment of doctrine, but they're read for inspiration. And uh, there's generally not an awful lot uh, in them that uh, raises too many eyebrows. There's some things in Tobit uh, and uh, uh, Second Maccabees, uh, praying for the dead, that gives rise to the notion of purgatory and so on. Those, uh, those kinds of texts uh, are still very enjoyable and helpful to read. And we wouldn't have a clue what the Feast of Dedication is in John chapter 10, first couple of verses, uh, without knowing First Maccabees and uh, the cleansing of the temple uh, that took place and the celebration of it. So uh, I find it very helpful and in my Protestant tradition, which doesn't uh, recognize them as sacred scripture on par with the uh, books in the Hebrew Bible, I always say, well, read them anyway. Uh, don't you want to be informed by the books that informed the earliest Christians? I do. And uh, I find a great deal in them that's very useful and helpful, inspirational. And uh, most of the uh, Christians in the world today make use of them. 
So uh, though the Orthodox don't recognize them as scripture, they read them almost like they are in their liturgies, but they follow uh, Athanasius uh, in the fourth century, in his festal letter, 39th festal letter that let the churches know when to celebrate Easter. So he would send little messages out with these letters every year. And in the 39th one, in 367, he listed all of the books of the uh, Old Testament and New Testament for the Christians. He didn't include uh, most of the uh, Deuterocanonicals, though he included uh, Baruch. And, uh, and he excluded uh, Esther, but he included the four most popular books that he thought would be useful to, uh, to read in churches, and that would be uh, Tobit and Judith and uh, Wisdom and uh, uh, Wisdom of Solomon and Sirach. Um, and then he had, uh, there's another one that'll come to my mind in a moment, but uh, he then had uh, uh, said it was okay to read those plus the Didache, uh, the Christian Didache and the uh, Shepherd of Hermas. Right. Uh, so when I was in Moscow, I made a foolish mistake of thinking that they had the exact same books that the Eastern Orthodox have and uh, put them in the same order, and they don't. But those, uh, uh, I learned I learned from the, the folks. I spoke to a group of professors uh, who were Orthodox and Catholic, and we met at a Catholic seminary in Moscow. And uh, I learned as much as I shared, I think, uh, uh, while there. But they have, uh, they use the Greek term uh, 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 gignos um, there's a smoother way to say it, but I wanted to get all of the, the letters in there, the Greek letters, uh, which simply means readable books. And uh, they were not to be read in churches, but they were readable and useful. Uh, the Western churches, the Catholic tradition said, no, they're scripture. And they were read like scripture, but the Orthodox don't accept them on the same par as the Hebrew Bible scriptures, but uh, functionally, they functioned pretty much the same way that they do in the Catholic Church, though they don't build a lot of doctrine on them. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but uh, I, I hope I didn't lose you in the dust there. <laughs> no, so you're talking about the Russian Orthodox then? Yeah, yeah, yeah the Russian Orthodox uh, and the... Uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox, and there's also the Oriental Orthodox, the four main branches, uh, uh, they all use pretty much the same books with the exception the Russians have all four of the Maccabees and a couple of others uh, that uh, the Eastern Orthodox don't have. And all of the, Ortho the uh, Oriental Orthodox are pretty close to the Eastern Orthodox with a couple of exceptions and especially the Ethiopian and uh, uh, I'll think of the other term, uh, uh, the, uh, the Orthodox uh, Christians in uh, uh, Egypt. Uh, the, oh, the Coptic. The Coptic, that's the term yeah. I was trying to come up yeah. with. Uh, right. It, it yeah. wasn't gonna spit out very quickly, but that, yeah, the Coptic tradition is also in the Orthodox tradition. Yes. And they welcome uh, most of the books plus others. Uh, and the, the largest Old Testament canon and New Testament canon is the Ethiopian one. And uh, they were separated from the rest of Christendom when, uh, from the time of the Muslim overcoming that uh, uh, part of the world uh, for almost a thousand years. And so they didn't know all of the things that were going on in the uh, Catholic and Orthodox traditions. So... Uh, I say uh, what they had may well have been uh, coming from uh, Syria. The Syrians uh, evangelized that part of the world and the Syrian Christians uh, probably brought a number of the books to them uh, that make up their current Bible to this day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, go ahead, William. I don't wanna. Uh, no, those are, those are very, very great, great conversation, gentlemen, fantastic. And that the, the really good point, sir, Dr. McDonald, it, it, it brings me to something that uh, uh, we've talked about before in private dialogue. And it really, I know it would really edify the audience to hear about it. We were talking about uh, a, a number of these books and how, and I, and I agree with you, even, 
even if our Protestant brothers and sisters don't uh, view them as canonical or as sacred scripture, you know, read them. Yeah, you know, uh, we would argue, of course, that it's sacred scripture, but if they don't think it is, you know, there's still edifying, uplifting stuff to find in them. But sure. what, uh, what about the issue with Baruch? We've talked about this before, and I know it'll fascinate a number of people. This is a very interesting thing that I have had on my mind for a while because people have brought it up and I was talking to you about it um, earlier. We've talked about it before and you, you frequently mention it in, in, in shows we've done in the past in your books, how it was accepted in early councils and the early church. But why is it that sometimes we only see Jeremiah listed? What is, what is going on with that there? Well, often... Uh... Uh, Baruch and uh, the uh, uh, epistle of Jeremiah are rolled into and connected with um, uh, Jeremiah. Uh, clearly today, the Catholic Church has accepted it, but the earliest canons uh, in North Africa and in Rome did not. Uh, they're not listed in, uh, say, the, uh, uh, the councils uh, that uh, listed the scriptures in uh, uh, Hippo and in Carthage and uh, Hippo in 393 and 397 and then 416 uh, but also uh, uh, earlier uh, 382 was the Rome Council and in none of those and it shows the, the uh, closeness of and historically the closeness of the uh, uh, churches in North Africa to Rome uh, they agreed pretty much on that. So Baruch wasn't in, uh, introduced, but eventually it was. Now, and, let me, uh, let me, let me ask you this. Do you think it's possible? Yeah. And, and the reason I ask is because we've dialogued about this before. Um, I'm curious, do you think it's possible Baruch would have been included in there specifically because um, if you look at the North African councils, one of the prime movers of that being St. Augustine, who, who did argue yep. for it to have been rolled up with Jeremiah. Do you think it's possible that it possibly would have been included there? Well, as you know, he was very instrumental in yep. the uh, uh, Hippo and Carthage uh, councils. And uh, uh, I just don't know of a text that says specifically that uh, they were accepted by the churches there. Uh, certainly not listed in what uh, we have in the council decisions. But uh, eventually, uh, that was included. Uh, it's interesting, in the Western tradition, uh, the epistle of Jeremiah is chapter 6 in uh, yeah. uh, Baruch. And uh, Baruch has five chapters. But in the Eastern and the Orthodox tradition, it's between Ecclesiastes and Lamentations. It's separated uh, from that. But it clearly had uh, some significance for some period of time. Uh, I'm not convinced that Baruch, the uh, companion of Jeremiah, actually wrote it, right. but it's written in his name and a number of books like that. And uh, uh, I, I could care less who wrote a book. I'm more interested in its content. So, yeah. Uh, unlike some that if uh, Paul didn't write Hebrews, which I don't think he did, should we throw it out of our Bible? I said, no, no, no. God had more talented children in the ancient world than we give him credit for. Uh, the book of Hebrews had a powerful message for Christians that were being persecuted and who were tempted to leave their faith. So I, uh, I've always appreciated, I regularly try to teach the book of Hebrews in churches when I travel around from church to church and, and do uh, Bible studies. Uh, that's a powerful book, has a very good, uh, a good message to it. I, I always go with Origen. He said, God only knows who wrote it, but he wasn't willing to throw it away. <laughs> yeah, that, th those are really, really good points there. And um, uh, I really appreciate your, your um, uh, really emphasizing how, how Augustine was the prime mover there. And in, in my opinion, it really does open up a very interesting conversation because uh, before before we get to those North African councils, and, and I don't remember it off the top of my head. Maybe Gary, maybe you have, maybe you recall where where Augustine does attribute uh, the words of Baruch to have been um, uh, from the prophet Jeremiah. It's escaping me. Do, do, do yeah, you know well, he he mentions, and I forgot where it was. Maybe it's City of God, where um, 
Baruch, there's two traditions. One is that it's included with Jeremiah and one where it's, it stands separately. And uh, yeah. I, I can't remember which one he says is the more ancient of the two. Very good. But he did, he did, um, he did believe it to have been prophetic and he did believe that it was sacred scripture, I imagine. Yeah, I, th I think most of the ancients, if you look at how they use Baruch, I mean, they cited his scripture and so on. Um, yeah, it's in a lot of the uh, collections, the canon lists, uh, uh, it's, it's there. And uh, sometimes uh, the uh, epistle of Jeremiah isn't mentioned, but it's generally included as a part, of, certainly in the Western churches, as a part of Baruch. Yeah. Yeah, and, and sometimes, it's, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. McDonald, but sometimes uh, the ancients will break certain books out, and then sometimes they'll just say Jeremiah, or they'll just say Jeremiah and Lamentations, or they'll say Jeremiah, Lamentations, Baruch, and then, you know, they, they will sometimes kind of pull out distinct books, but usually it's, it's that is a group that they see it as. Uh, well, I think it does come out as a group, but uh, you may be right. I, I'm just trying to think of some ex uh, examples, though. Uh, I do know in the canon lists, uh, some of them are more specific about including uh, Baruch and the epistle of Jeremiah, and some are not. And those that are not doesn't mean they didn't include it. It just, uh, they didn't say it. And, right, uh, yeah. So, uh, right. Yeah. And, and that's important, too, because there's so much we don't know, you know, <laughs> so I mean, whether or not they uh, include something or bundled it together or broke it apart or they just omit it altogether. You know, sometimes that's difficult to just determine if you especially if you don't have other writings of theirs to compare it to. This discussion actually raises a very good question, which uh, uh, William sent to me initially. And, uh, and it, it raises a problem for all of us. Uh, you said, uh, uh, the, uh, what is the Apocrypha or the Deutero canon books? And uh, what are they? And uh, how should they uh, uh, be important to all Christians? Well, the problem that we have is that uh, we don't know what books were in the Deutero canonicals. And the term Deutero canonical is actually... Uh, it came out after the Council of Trent, 1566, by uh, Sixtus of uh, uh, Siena, uh, and he, uh, uh, he mentioned the proto-canonical books and the deuterocanonical books. Those were the ones in the Septuagint. But how, how do we know what was in the Septuagint? All that we have are the Rolf's Hanhart uh, uh, editions, uh, Greek editions, uh, plus uh, uh, another one that just came out, a former uh, colleague of mine uh, in the Lexham uh, 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 publication uh, issued a translation of the uh, Septuagint books. Uh, and I sent him a note and I said, how do you know which ones to put in there? Because almost all of the, uh, the lists that we have uh, initially, I think there's five or six and se or seven that are listed in various canon lists. And once in a while, you'll get up to 10, as you find at uh, the Council of Trent. But uh, most of the manuscripts don't have all of the books uh, that we have. The, the largest one is the Codex uh, Alexandrinus, written in the early to middle 5th century. And uh, those are the ones that are included in the uh, Rolf uh, Hans, uh, Hanhart uh, edition of the Septuagint. So uh, when uh, the prayer of Manasseh, which uh, uh, is not in the Catholic uh, collection of Deuterocanonicals, but it is in the Orthodox, was it there originally? We haven't got a clue, but I really like it. And I've said it's a marvelous prayer of repentance. And if you think you've been a bad sinner, well, look at what he did from Second uh, Chronicles chapter 33 and earlier in Second Kings. He was a bad king, but he came to his senses accordingly in chapter 33 of Second Chronicles. And this prayer came out. It's a marvelous prayer of uh, 
thanking God for his grace and mercy and pleading your case before God not to justify yourself because he doesn't. And he accepts and pleads for the mercy of God. I, I like that. That's not a bad prayer to pray. Mm -hmm. Even an old Baptist like me could figure that one out. So anyway, uh, but uh, whether Baruch was or was not included in uh, the epistle of Jeremiah, uh, I can't give you a definitive answer because those who put together, the only copies of the Septuagint that we have were put together by Christians, and they don't always agree in the manuscripts that have survived on what was in them. Does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, it totally, and, and for, 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 for me, I, I do think it totally does make sense. Um, and I don't argue that every time we've got Jeremiah listed that you must have Baruch rolled up there. I do think that, it, it, that the case is, is a very strong one for the North African councils, primarily because of Augustine. And as you said, uh, you said if there is a quote uh, you know, from Augustine that would indicate as such that would uh, lend to the power of it. So I think in terms of that, I think we, we, we've got strong evidence there, but you're right there. I, don't, I would not present that argument, uh, you know, every single time we've got it listed because as you brought up, you made a very good point. Sometimes canon lists have Baruch listed um, separate uh, as a standalone. Is that correct? Yeah. And uh, interestingly, in the uh, Carthage and uh, uh, the Hippo canons, we don't have a copy of the Hippo canon, but it was essentially yep. repeated in the Carthage one in 397. In the New Testament ones, they also uh, have the list of books they attribute eventually by 419 uh, Hebrews to Paul, but uh, includes that you can also read the story of the martyrs uh, in the churches. Oh, and yeah. canon is all about you can read in the churches. So I said, gee, uh, I wrote a piece a number of years ago, and I used that as a starting point. And I went through the Acta Sanctorum, uh, which was the story of the martyrdoms of an, uh, ancient Christianity. And that was read in the churches. And we have a day out of the year where we have the uh, memory uh, in the church's calendar to remember All Saints Day, which is those who died in, uh, uh, with their faith intact as martyrs. Now we include everybody that we think is a Christian in, in, the, in that collection. So, sorry, go ahead. I, that, that, that's I incredible. Wow, here. that, 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 um, uh, that is definitely seems to be uh, something you don't hear every day coming from a Baptist. Isn't that correct, Gary? <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. That's very true. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I'm Professor, uh, the, North, the North African councils, were they weren't relying on the Septuagint, though, right? They were relying on the Old Latin. Well, the uh, North African councils, uh, by that time, there was a Latin translation that was available, the Old Latin, and uh, some of them read that, and... Uh, I don't know everything that was in the old translation because the fragments of it that have survived are not that clear. Uh, but uh, some of them were quite good with Greek. And the last, I think, to uh, uh, put his writings in Greek and in Latin was Tertullian. And uh, uh, by the time of Augustine, he could write freely uh, in uh, Latin. And uh, I think that's the, uh, and that particular text, he disagreed with uh, Jerome on whether to include or not to include the Deuterocanonicals. And uh, uh, it, there's much that we don't, uh, maybe I should put it this way, there's much that I don't know <laughs> uh, about that and what was in it. And I haven't found too many people that do except uh, individuals who spoke don't always speak for everybody. And uh, what was said by a church father and the eastern part doesn't mean everybody far west as far as Spain agreed with it. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the misnomers. People will find a text where somebody said A and then they think everybody else said A. And uh, no, some of them said B, but uh, we make assumptions based on very limited information. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing that I 
and, and I, I did a, it does um, come up very often in dialoguing with not only Catholics, with uh, Orthodox, um, and as you mentioned, Ethiopians, they have uh, what is probably the largest can and everything, everything in the kitchen sink really tossed in there. So, um, but, but when we look at Hippo, Carthage, Rome, or any of those councils, when we look at the inclusion of these deuterocanonical books or apocryphal texts, does, in your opinion, do the inclusion of these books, do they reflect early Christian usage of them? Oh, I think so. Uh, I, I find parallels, and it raises a question. Some of my Protestant colleagues that want to have nothing to do with them say none of them are quoted with the typical uh, scriptural introductions uh, in the New Testament, and that's, that's correct. Uh, but Jesus uh, cited the book of Daniel, quoted from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, it's found in Mark chapter 14, verse 62, and he doesn't use as it is written or uh, as it, uh, the scriptures say or any of those typical introductions. Yep. And the book of Hebrews uh, which cites right at the very beginning, it's a quotation of uh, uh, Wisdom 725, I think it's, uh, that's the text. Uh, he doesn't introduce any scriptures on his own that start with as the scripture says. Uh, with one exception, it's found in chapter 10, and he, uh, Hebrews has more um, quotations of the Old Testament than any other book of the New Testament, uh, but clearly uh, he is informed by the wisdom of Solomon and some other texts, but he doesn't use any of those in, uh, typical uh, introductions, but nobody would say he wasn't quoting from the Old Testament. So uh, I, and I've heard people uh, Roger Beckwith and a few others that said, well, when Jude cited Enoch, he didn't say as it says in the scriptures. Uh, no, but he said as uh, Enoch prophesied, that's the essence of what scripture is. A prophet was a person who spoke by inspiration of God. So I, uh, I, I think we need to be careful about drawing too firm of distinctions. And I think there's a number of parallels uh, to some of the deuterocanonical books uh, Romans chapter 2, and uh, some of you are maybe familiar with that, and Jimmy Dunn has written uh, uh, some work on that and made a strong case for it in his commentary on Romans. But those are, <clears throat> I, I just want folks to understand there's uh, a fair amount of fluidity in the early churches on what they accepted, and nobody was talking about uh, uh, which scriptures uh, are in and which are out in the first or second centuries. I think the first one to do that was uh, uh, Origen in the third century, but it still wasn't a popular notion until you get into the fourth century, and Eusebius does that uh, in his uh, ecclesiastical history, and then it becomes far more prominent in the uh, uh, in the, by the end of the fourth century, and the canon lists become, uh, begin to uh, come out after that period of time. Right. Now, Dr. McDonald, I, that's a really important point because I, I think part of the problem is how can we talk about a canon in an earlier period when the word canon wasn't applied to a collection of sacred books? I mean, that doesn't come yep. till Athanasius. So in yeah, a way, yeah. isn't it kind of artificial to say, well, unless it says, thus saith the Lord, then, you know, it's not canonical, quote unquote? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jacob Neusner, the Jewish scholar who published one or two books, I don't know if you heard about it, over <laughs> I, You mean over his lifetime? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Children's book, besides, uh, he talked, he wrote a book called Writing with Scripture. And the New Testament writers wrote with scripture. Yeah. That is, they cited texts that were familiar to them uh, without saying, as it says in the book of, and you'll find some of that in the New Testament, but more often than not, uh, they're simply citing scriptural or uh, uh, using verbal uh, expressions from various texts. 
uh, Jesus has some of those in regard to the book of Enoch. And um, uh, Matthew 19, 28, uh, he speaks about the Son of Man coming, sitting on his throne of glory. That's also found in Matthew 25, 31. It's only found in the book of Enoch in the parables, uh, 47 through 63 uh, 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 chapters. Those, uh, those references, did Jesus know the book of Enoch? I don't know if he ever read it, but perhaps the traditions that were in it were circulating, and we're pretty sure they were circulating in Palestine in the time of Jesus. And quite often, uh, Jim Charlesworth, a good friend of mine, said uh, uh, he has found evidence for it being circulated and known well up into northern uh, Galilee. So uh, these were translocal texts, and the early Christians showed familiar with them. And Jude actually mentions them by name, and he quotes 1 Enoch 1 9. And uh, Tertullian didn't want to throw out the book of Jude because, I'm sorry, Enoch, because Jude cited it and he'd already accepted Jude as scripture. So it's, it's an interesting argument that goes on, but I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I, I may have interrupted you there. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you didn't. No, I was no, just, uh, I, I think part of the problem is the writers themselves knew which books were sacred. They use them in their writings. But that's a totally different question than how we, thousands of years later, can look at those writings and discern, well, is this just a sacred text? Is this just an edifying text? Is this, you know what I mean? And uh, so I, I think a lot of people punt and they say, oh, unless it says, thus saith the Lord, then it must yeah. just be a pious text that really wasn't held as sacred. And I, that strikes me as artificial. Uh, it, it surely is. And uh, thus says the Lord is found very common in, uh, in the prophets in the Old Testament, but it's not used as often in the new. Yeah. And that's where Neusner's writing with scripture, I think is very, is very helpful. The uh, uh, something maybe we should say here about the Jewish and Christian uh, notions of scripture, the Christians separated from the Jews while those Deuterocanonicals and pseudepigraphal writings were circulating among the Jews in Palestine. And the Christians separated and they carried the scriptures with them or the sacred texts with them that uh, uh, were circulating. Most of the texts at Qumran are uh, not what we call biblical books. They're not in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, of the almost now, it used to be uh, they thought they had 900 manuscripts that they found at Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now they're saying probably about a thousand. Of the thousand, only a little over 200 are a biblical text in the Hebrew Bible, and the rest are outside of that. And they're both pseudepigraphal and apocryphal books. Some of the apocrypha are cited, like Tobit and uh, Wisdom and so on, um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But... Uh, uh, the question was raised, did the Jews know anything about the uh, or accept the apocryphal books? Of course they did. They wrote them. And uh, uh, Great point. You'll, find, you'll find their use in, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, without any distinction from the biblical books. Uh, so it was a larger collection of books that got narrowed over the years. The Protestants narrowed them down. Uh, long after the time of Martin Luther uh, to a smaller collection and then uh, uh, to the Hebrew Bible. And then they started opening up in the 1950s saying, you know, some of those aren't too bad. Maybe we should take a look at them again. Bruce Metzger at Princeton uh, wanted to make sure that everything that Christians of whatever sort thought was scripture would be included in their larger collection of uh, uh, biblical books. Uh, the annotated uh, uh, Oxford uh, Bible has the largest collection of books, some of which are found only uh, in uh, the Orthodox churches and some uh, uh, Ethiopian and some in the Catholic. Okay. Yeah. Um, when well, I was, you, you mentioned I that you mentioned that these books oh, circulated within uh, Palestine area 
uh, amongst the yeah. Jews. Would that include the Pharisees, pre-70 Pharisees? Uh uh, probably, but we, uh, I think the Pharisees had a greater influence on the scope of the Hebrew Bible. They were the main uh, religious sect that emerges out of the, uh, uh, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem. And they meet together at Jamnia, and then it moves to four different places, and eventually up in Galilee at Tiberias. And uh, they're making uh, some decisions, and they're even debating. And the mission just shows some of the debates that were going on on some of the books. But uh, they don't speak too much about the Deuterocanonicals in the rabbinic tradition, but they really favored for quite some time. There's over 200 references to, the, uh, to Sirach or Ecclesiasticus in the rabbinic tradition, and a number of references where it's called as it is written, introduced by the scriptural uh, introduction uh, for Sirach. Uh, that's the exception that uh, some of the folks can't quite get their hands on. They don't know what to do with that. But I just said it was it varied for a while. Uh, Esther was uh, uh, questioned for a period of time. So was Ecclesiastes and uh, Song of Songs. And everybody that uh, used those books always uh, interpreted them allegorically or metaphorically to say something else. Like uh, uh, in Esther, uh, who was the, the key players in there? And then I've seen people uh, try to make uh, parallels with the early church. And uh, the same thing with Song of Songs and who was the, uh, the, uh, the man in Song of Songs and it actually was an erotic song, but yeah. uh, they made the the man uh, Christ and the the bride the church, uh, the woman the church, and uh, the Jews did the same thing, and uh, uh, God versus the Jewish people, but everybody that read it had to in, reinterpret it because it really isn't a very scriptural, uh, biblical type uh, writing, but they've included it, and so. Most of the time, people ignore it these days and don't do much preaching or teaching on it, and they hope nobody asks any questions about it. How's that for being <laughs> candid? <laughs> uh, William, I need to go, so can I ask one last question? Then I'll oh, hand definitely. It over. No doubt, Gary. Please do. Yeah, uh, Dr. McDonald, I'm just curious what you think of the rewritten scriptures in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, what do you make of huh? that? Uh, it's interesting... <laughs> you have a lot of that in the Old Testament itself. And it was also in early Christianity. I mean, Deutero, uh, Deuteronomy is a rewritten law. That's the point of it. And the Chronicles rewrote the Kings. And uh, Jubilees uh, that you find is a rewriting of uh, Genesis plus some of the uh, other uh, parts of the Pentateuch. And uh, rewriting the scripture uh, I, I prefer rewriting a scripture in, instead of the rewritten Bible because there was no Bible at that time, which meant a fixed collection. But uh, I, I, I find it very interesting, and uh, I, I've been involved with looking at Jubilees lately uh, for that very reason and, and some of the arguments for what it did and expanded, and some uh, preferred it. There are more copies of Jubilees in the Dead Sea Scrolls than there are of some of the biblical books. The same thing of Enoch uh, it was very common, very popular. If you just look at the books that they found and the number of books, uh, the Temple Scroll has more copies than uh, most of the other books outside of the Psalms and Deuteronomy and uh, uh, Isaiah at uh, Qumran. So. Yeah. All right. Very good. Well, gentlemen, I, I'm going to have to leave, but you know, thank you, Dr. McDonald, for joining. Thank you. Nice to interact with you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun, Gary. Thank you very much. Look forward to talking to you again soon, brother. This has been an uh, incredible discussion. And before we wrap it up, uh, Dr. McDonald, I do want to ask you a question that I've always had in my mind, because I know that if I, um, if I'm walking down the street, um, and let's say I run into a, a brother, a friend of mine uh, from the Coptic Church, or, or a friend from, um, from a, a various uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, or a Catholic. And let's say in, uh, 
in some kind of fantasy kind of world, we all just so happen to be holding Bibles. Um, each of us may have different books with us. Would And then let's say we run into you, Dr. McDonald, you're coming out of some location, we run into you. Would these deuterocanonical books or apocryphal books, would these books belong in your Bible? What are your thoughts about that? Oh, thank you. Interestingly, that very question was asked me when I was in Rome, and because wow. uh, they knew my own Protestant background, <laughs> and uh, they said, did we get it right? And I said, yes, you did. And uh, you have a lot of examples from history, church history, that shows that the deuterocanonical books were there. But which ones is unclear in your tradition and in other traditions? And I was asked a similar question uh, uh, worded differently uh, when I was speaking to a group of Orthodox professors in uh, Athens, and uh, they even asked, why in the world are you folks in the West so interested in canon stuff, you know, because they never had a finalized canon, yep. and uh, I said, well, what books are you using, and are they advancing your Christian faith, and if they are, then keep reading them, and uh, I, uh, I've encouraged Protestants for years to read them because they have some strong messages in them that are very useful. Some are entertaining. Uh, I like the history books, especially because I'm primarily a New Testament historian. And uh, uh, how do I get along uh, with Maccabees? I love it. And uh, second Maccabees has some other challenges related and uh, uh, Tobit and uh, Judith. Uh, I, I think they're telling interesting stories that I can follow and I enjoy. Yeah. But uh, in Wisdom and in Sirach, there's some wonderful uh, teachings in there on the wisdom tradition. And uh, if you're inspired by it, look, <clears throat> I have in uh, something that I send out now and then is the prayer of St. Francis Assisi. Uh, he would never have said this is scripture. And uh, most people wouldn't. They haven't included in their Bibles, but I've been blessed by it. I've been blessed by something Mother Teresa said and something Billy Graham said. Uh, I'm inspired by it, and so I, I, I make use of it. Uh, did you get it right? Sure. If it's working for you, I'd say you probably got it right. But uh, does that sound too equivocating? Uh, some of my Protestant friends think I should tear them apart. Well, uh, some parts of them, uh, I'm not ready to, to tear apart, but uh, the deuterocanonical books uh, were, in, uh, in essence, uh, whether the offering of uh, indulgences for uh, uh, the sake of forgiveness or advancement in the church or whatever, I, I'm not into that, but there's an awful lot of stuff that is really quite good and uh, and helpful in them. So I, I don't throw it away. Uh, I'm not ready to open up uh, the Bible canon. I was asked a few years ago, uh, and I got the book, uh, I got contacted by the Mormons, and they said, you said in one of your canon books that there's no biblical foundation for closing the biblical canon. Is that correct? And I said, yes, that's correct. Um, and uh, when that was done, uh, uh, I said, you quoted me correctly, but out of context. Uh, the early churches and the churches now are not in, including new books uh, any longer. Uh, they've settled pretty much on the books that they're citing, but they wanted the books that were closest to the time of Jesus for the New Testament and that uh, continued the essence of faith. I don't believe that the Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, and Doctrine and Covenants, that they wanted to use me to say were useful for the churches and therefore should be included. I said, I don't think you'd find any church fathers that would uh, follow along with uh, those particular books. So I'm not nope. ready to open it up to that. So uh, I, I don't know if that answers uh, the question that you have. I'm open to reading them and learning from them. And uh, we need them as a good bridge between the Old and New Testament books, the Hebrew Bible books, yeah, uh, but uh, there's a lot of good teaching in them. That, that, actually, that's a great question. That, that's a great answer. 
That was a fantastic answer. That, that is great. And it gets really to the heart of the issue because I agree with you. I believe that we do need them and lacking them uh, in certain areas, lacking that uh, essential bridge, in my opinion, um, you know, does, you know, d it would be useful having that essential bridge. In other words, I totally agree with you. <coughs> Excuse me, Dr. McDonald. But before we wrap up, before we wrap up, and by the way, for the audience wondering, we're going to have the incredible Dr. McDonald on more than once again. But Dr. McDonald, can you tell the audience before we do wrap up for today, what are you working on? Anything new? Any new books? Any new projects? What do you have coming down the pipeline? Well, I, I have about three or four articles that will be coming out this year and next, but uh, mostly on biblical issues related, uh, some for the Orthodox Christians, uh, the Hebrew uh, uh, people, the Jewish people, uh, uh, Jewish Publication Society. And, uh, uh, and I think I've shared uh, earlier, and I forgot whether we were online or not, uh, on the fluidity of the formation of the Hebrew Bible. It took centuries for it to uh, uh, come to its current position. And also that was the same thing was true for the churches. The churches have never fully agreed on the scope of their Old Testament. Uh, in part, that's because the limited resources that we have. So I'm bringing, uh, I brought that out and uh, you'll find the Dead Sea Scrolls is a marvelous uh, example of the use of non-canonical writings. And uh, they were there. I'm currently writing on uh, 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 early authority in Christianity before there was a Bible. The churches gathered together. They didn't have a Bible uh, in hand, and most of them didn't have all of the uh, books of the Hebrew Bible in hand. Uh, they might have had a few favorites at best. Uh, generally, they quote the early church fathers, quote, mostly as Jesus did from uh, Deuteronomy, the Psalms, and Isaiah, but others as well. And the church fathers had access to more than the average pastor of a local congregation. The congregations couldn't read most of the time, and uh, those who were literate would read lections or uh, sections of various books in worship. So the people would learn the Christian faith through that, but also through the hymns that they sang and uh, through the uh, affirmations that were given at baptisms and the serving of the Eucharist. So I'm focusing on that before there was a Bible for anybody to say, hey, according to John's gospel, this is what uh, Jesus said or whatever. Nobody talked like that in the first uh, few centuries. Yep. So I'm going to be going through about three or four centuries and showing the development and emergence. The, the creeds of the church that were read in the churches uh, began to expand, but not at the core elements. Uh, uh, those remained the same. Jesus had a special relationship with God, and he died on a cross for our sins, and that he was raised from the dead. All Christians agree on that core element, and it doesn't change in the creeds. Most of the, the earliest creeds, the lion's share of them is about Jesus and the identity of Jesus, what he did, and its implications for uh, Christian faith. But eventually, they added other things to address other issues that were coming their way, uh, like uh, God is Father. Uh, I'm sorry, God is creator of all things heaven and earth. That's found in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, I think. And uh, yet, uh, that's not found in the creeds, the formal creeds that you find in the New Testament. But because Marcion, one of the early heretics in the second century, and the Gnostics, denied that God created uh, uh, heaven and earth. Uh, they used a demiurg or a craftsman uh, to do that, uh, that uh, and had nothing to do with the unknown God of Jesus, who was a God of love. So the Christians started saying God, uh, they begin with God, who is a uh, father and creator of all things in heaven and earth. And then emphasizing that Jesus was crucified uh, by Pontius Pilate. Uh, that puts him in history as a human being, and uh, the Docetics wanted to deny the body of Jesus. So the creeds began to expand, but the core essence of them, right at the heart of it, did not over the centuries. I think that's still true to this day, though uh, in my tradition, what I hate to see 
uh, is something that was not seen in early Christianity. Uh, we put the Bible sometimes in the very first place and uh, in the creeds. And I said, wait a minute. I thought God came before the Bible did. And uh, uh, I, I emphasize those kinds of uh, stupid things that go on in the churches. Well, the Bible is where they've divided. So they want to put their statements up front. But uh, I, I was the uh, chair of the ordination council uh, up in the Maritimes for the Baptist churches. And I was the uh, chief examiner, and I would always ask the, the traditional student uh, coming through the ordinance after they finish seminary, they give a statement of faith, and, and I'd say, uh, tell me, what is your uh, understanding of scripture? And they give us a little answer. Uh, the Bible is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. And I said, Gee, would you turn to Matthew 28, 19? Jesus said, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Yep. Uh, go before him and disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and so on. I said, when did Jesus transfer his authority to the Bible? And they generally just looked dumbfounded because they'd never had a class on that. And I said, you need to understand that the Bible is always a derived authority that points us to the final authority, which is God. And uh, keep that in mind. We don't worship the Bible. We worship the God of the Bible and the Christ who's presented in the Bible. Dr. McDonald, what a fantastic, fantastic answer. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. And we look forward to hosting you again, to having you again. Thank you very much. And thank you for thank your you. time. And thank you for all your great works, all your great books. And we'll talk soon again, Dr. McDonald. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. Make sure you hit like, share, subscribe, go check out Dr. McDonald's books and keep an eye out because we 